You are listening to the Foreign Policy Focus Podcast. We cannot wait for the final proof. The smoking gun it could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Haven't you driven enough people from their homes over bulldoze their villages, seize their property under the laws they had no part in making? Now working in Libya with friends and allies, we've demonstrated what collective action can achieve in the 21st century. Now the host of the show, Kyle Inslee. This is episode 297 of the Foreign Policy Focus podcast. I want to start off today's show talking about this new movie out, Vice. I have a few things to say about, you know, this is a big name Hollywood movie with big name stars, Christian Bale, Amy Adams, and they cover topics like the Iraq war and the U.S. torture program. And so I really want to talk about the the portrayals of that in the movie. I think there was some stuff that was very well done, some stuff that was a little lacking, but I think overall a good job. And so I think everybody will find that interesting and you know, maybe it'll be a good way to work foreign policy into your everyday conversations, uh, you know, at least for a couple of weeks as people talk to you about this movie. Also, I want to mention that next week I had the 300th episode of the show, so I got special interviews coming up next week. I've already recorded two of them. They're great. You definitely want to get, catch them. So make sure you're subscribing to the show on some kind of, uh, you know, podcatcher or listening service that's on, you know, YouTube, BitChute, iTunes, Stitcher. If you can, give it ratings, reviews, thumbs up, shares. I really appreciate when everybody has the time to do all that. You can find all my work at libertarianinstitute.org. My daily news roundup and the show are featured there on the homepage. And then if you really support the show um, and you can get access to a little bit of bonus content that I produce at patreon.com slash foreign policy focus. So I mainly want to kind of center my discussion of the movie Vice around the things that um, you know I think are related to the terror wars and the torture program and stuff like that. But I will say, you know, the movie's a pretty brutal character assassin- assassination of Dick Cheney. I see, be, you know, portraying him as a pretty ruthless guy, and, you know, pretty terrible at heart, and just, you know, a political shark to the core, you know, looking for as much power as he could possibly get his hands on. I think most of the characters do, uh, you know, our actors do a pretty good job of playing their characters. I think uh, Bale does a pretty good Cheney. Uh, you know, um, Steve Carell is Donald Rumsfeld and. Amy Adams is uh, Cheney's wife. I think there's a couple other big stars, people I recognize there, but uh, I don't watch many movies. I'm not really plugged into the entertainment culture, so I'm pretty bad with like this, you know, this kind of movie review part stuff. So I really want to move into the um, actual war crimes here. I will say I think they play George Bush just a little too cartoonishly, and uh, my only problem with this is just I think it starts to absolve him of all the war crimes committed under his administration. It kind of just makes him to be this dupe, this puppet of Dick Cheney. When in reality, I mean, George Bush did have control over his administration. One thing I think the movie does well is it kind of lays out how Dick Cheney designed the Trump administration. And essentially what I think he tried to do is block anybody from getting to George Bush that may uh, believe in any kind of war powers constraints or not want to go along with his policy. I think you even see at one point it's, uh, Steve Carell, Donald Rumsfeld comes in and, you know, kind of tells Cheney, like, look, you know, there's this uh, intelligence out that was going to go to George Bush, but I, I stopped it from getting there. Cheney also sets up the White House in the way that, you know, he's getting briefed on everything first every day. Uh, you see in the movie that he says, you know, we're really going to go through every potential terrorist ad claim and, you know, really make it seem like an overwhelming thing how active these terrorist groups are, even if a lot of the, you know, intelligence is unconfirmed or pretty poor. I think that part of the movie uh, would be a good lesson to the Trump administration, especially since right now, it very much seems to me that you have Mike Pompeo running around undermining Donald Trump's uh, Syria policy. You know, he's adding conditions to the withdrawal. And here you have sources in the Pentagon saying that we haven't changed our plans. We're going ahead with the withdrawal as the president said, and we don't take orders from John Bolton. It's also worth noting, there's this article in the, I believe, New York Review of Butts. It's a very long article, and I don't agree with, you know, every sentence and every paragraph in there, but basically what the neocons are up to today. And, you know, th- this is the group of people, kind of the, the people Cheney put in power in the, you know, Bush administration in the Vice movie, are now all in different roles in different places uh, as Trump really shook up U.S. foreign policy. And, and, you know, really U.S. establishment politics. I think at one point, you know, uh, the neocons are probably pretty marginalized at the start of the Trump administration with, you know, people like Steve Bannon and Stephen Miller and Michael Flynn around. Uh, but, you know, most of these people have been chased out. You now have a national security advisor named John Bolton and, 
Richard Goldberg and other uh, really, you know, serious neocons around Trump's foreign policy. So I'll link to that uh, article in the show notes page. But to get back to the movie here, I think the movie does a good job of kind of explaining how Iraq really had nothing to do with 9-11, uh, who Zarqawi is. I think it kind of skipped a step and didn't really explain the blowback well enough, which is unfortunate because it's a really important theme here um, that they kind of just portray uh, did Cheney's mistake of emphasizing the importance of Zarqawi uh, as the reason for his rise to power, but was also the fact that the U.S. went to the country, created a huge power vacuum, and killed an awful lot of innocent people that rallied uh, people to put to the Al-Qaeda cause. Speaking of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, I think there's a mistake where they conflate uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq with what eventually becomes ISIS. Now, I'm not saying that the Bush administration isn't responsible for the Sunni insurgency in Iraq, but the Obama administration, I think, is really responsible for the rise of the Islamic State and the spread of the Sunni insurgency then into Syria. Uh, then you have the declaration of the Islamic State, the split between uh, Baghdadi and Jolani, where you now have you know, the, the like, Harir Turir al-Sham in northern Syria and then the Islamic State or, you know, al-Qaeda in Iraq, I believe, is still a group. So you, you have different splits here. And, it, you know, it absolves Barack Obama way too much uh, for the responsibility for the rise of ISIS uh, by just kind of pinning this all on Dick Cheney. But absolutely everything that happened in Iraq is all, uh, you know, Dick Cheney and George Bush's fault. And certainly, uh, even if you did, you know, have... The United States armed the Sunni insurgency, uh, you know, in Syria at the beginning of the Syrian civil war. Had you not had the overthrow of Saddam Hussein already, uh, I think it's very likely that uh, those guys don't end up taking Mosul and a bunch of Iraqi cities. Maybe they push across the border a little bit, but you had to think like, you know, the Saddam government uh, would have turned the Islamic Caliphate around at the Syrian border for the most part. They also didn't mention that the area that the movie fails to mention that Zarqawi, when, you know, before the Iraq war, was actually in the northern part of uh, Iraq that was under American air power protection, uh, the, the Kurdish area. And so it's not like he was hiding under Saddam Hussein's per protection or the U.S. would even have had to have, uh, you know, bombed Iraq to get to him at all. I think they could have done a better job here, uh, just a little bit, explaining the false intelligence used to link Saddam Hussein to Al Qaeda, specifically the use of terror, uh, you know, torture in that. You know, they, they tortured, I believe, this lie out of Abu Zubayda, whose name was not mentioned in the movie. Um, I also think here, you know, the event, I think eventually this has to do with, uh, Colin Powell and his U, uh, UN speech, a uh, very famous UN speech that really, I think, encouraged a lot of the rest of the world to go along with the United States and help lie the United States into the Iraq war. That he was skeptical, and, and you know, this is kind of shown in the movie. Uh, the real story, apparently, and I've heard this from Larry Wilkerson in a couple of places, including on the Scott Horton show, explained that him and Colin Powell, uh, Wilkerson, uh, was his chief of staff, uh, had a conversation, and they were like, well, I'm not sure about this intelligence. And then they went back in the room, and they said, oh, we just tortured, uh, you know, this connection out of this guy, and then Colin Powell went along with it. I think that would have been an interesting story to include here, and it wasn't. So, yeah, overall, on the connections between Saddam and Al-Qaeda, they, they definitely could, you know, done a little bit of a better job going into the debunkings. But I get that, you know, I'm probably one of the few people in the audience really looking for that. I will say the portrayal of torture in the movie I thought was very good. They cut in and out. They show, I believe, actual video from not torture, but, you know, some of the photographs and stuff, uh, you know, that have been taken from Abu Ghraib. Uh, and that their portrayals of torture that, you know, was filmed and simulated was, I, I thought pretty good and pretty graphic, uh, as well as, you know, the rest of the war imagery in the movie. Uh, when they're talking about the bombing, bombing of Cambodia, they have a little Cambodian girl, you know, standing there, uh, with the, you know, trying to get a chicken or something like that. And then her village gets blown up and it shows the actual victims of the war. It's just, you know, not a bunch of guys like, uh, Osama bin Laden with turbans on their head or whatever. Uh, you know, looking very menacing, standing around with AKs that are getting blown up. They show the actual civilians dying here. They cover the Niger yellow cake uranium uh, allegations that Saddam was buying. Uh, the yellow came from Niger, and that's how he was going to bake nuclear weapons, uh, specifically how they exposed the wife of the, the man who wrote about, you know, the, the debunking of that in the mainstream media. 
So I thought that was a pretty good angle and uh, a pretty important story to tell, and I was encouraged by that. I felt like they took a couple cheap shots at Scalia, but, you know, I'm a libertarian. They also lumped Cato Institute in with AEI, which is really ridiculous, especially since this is a, mostly a movie about foreign policy. Um, I, I, I do, I will say, I think a lot of the, like, kind of right-wing shaming in the movie was a little bit disappointing just because... Uh, they mostly took on Fox News rather than like the neocons and Weekly Standard. Um, and so maybe that's the name recognition of Fox News. And maybe, you know, that's just the way you had to make big budget movies for the masses. But, you know, if you look at it, uh, it, you know, it's the think tanks and, and it's places like the Weekly Standard that were producing the worst of, of the state propaganda. And Fox News, you know, was just picking it up and covering. I think there's a lot of other scandals that are more or less just mentioned once. Like uh, the Office of Special Plans and Douglas Fife and Paul Wolfowitz and, and his role at the Pentagon. You know, but overall, it, it lists all the neocons. It shames all of them for the Iraq War. It, it puts all that violence on them and in their responsibility. And so a lot of ways, it was great. Uh, the last note I have here is I think it does a pretty good job of critiquing John Yu, who, of course, writes the torture memos and stuff like this that gives the executive a whole bunch of power. And justify th things like a secret torture program or a secret spying program. It does uh, cover the spying issue a little bit and does a pretty good job with it when it, it does in the movie. Yeah, so overall, I, I thought the movie was pretty enjoyable. I think I have uh, covered now pretty much everything on my list of uh, topics from the movie I liked. You know, I only saw it in theaters once, so I couldn't like do a complete, you know, note taking in the theater. At least I stayed away for it the whole time. The guy behind me fell asleep, so I'm not sure. Uh, how, you know, much of the, this movie has, like, mainstream appeal. But, uh, you know, it was certainly an interesting movie. Like I said, the characters played well. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, it, it did a lot of shaming of people who did very nasty things. All right, now some other things going on. We have an announcement that Tulsi Gabbard's running for president in 2020. So I think it's a good thing that we'll at least have one Democrat up there who has legitimate anti-intervention tendencies and uh, can definitely go to war she's a veteran so she kind of has that standing nobody could shame her from that direction and she makes a good case you know she's done it on joe rogan i've seen plenty of times um so i'm not concerned at all that she's a fraud in the sense that she's suddenly gonna turn around like maybe uh alexandria cortez i believe is her name from new york uh, and immediately flip flops on these issues, and I think she's gonna stand tall. Although the like the Assadist smears are already coming out from all you know the right and left and everyone saying, "Oh my God, this girl loves Assad just because she didn't support arming Al Qaeda uh, when they were in opposition to Assad." So as her campaign rolls out here, we'll see how much emphasis she puts on the war issues. Maybe it ends up just being um, something that she tries not to talk about and focuses her all of her intention on increasing welfare and universal health care or stuff like this in which case i'll be highly disappointed uh but like i said she has taken stands on war issues in the past she's typically good on these kind of things and so uh it would always you know even if uh, it's not a potential win certainly the the better she's doing the polls and the more seriously the democrat party has to take her the more they have to contend with her uh non-interventionist tendencies on, on the debate stages and i think that's definitely a positive and one of the reasons why this is important is because the media is just so biased and we see this uh right now there's a new study out the intercept wrote on it about how whenever it's media coverage between the israel and palestine all the headlines are you know heavily biased towards israel they're much more likely to cite israeli sources over palestinian sources they typically don't have uh palestinians uh, you know, experts or advocates, you know, uh, cited in their articles. And so for this reason, the narrative that everybody gets on the situation is Palestinians bad and the Israelis are just defending themselves. So if you're not going to have the, a fair conversation in the media, <laughs> the best, you know, the next best thing is having a Ron Paul, a Rand Paul or a Tulsi Gabbard up there on stage fighting, you know, kind of in the foreign policy realm. Rand Paul is standing up to this anti BDS legislation. Uh, there's, uh, I think, a Marco Rubio bat thing going on right now in the Senate where they're trying to push through a bill that would uh, prevent federal contracts from going to, you know, companies that won't sign a commitment not to boycott Israel. It's an absolute violation of free speech, Rand Paul points this out. However, he has to, you know, say that I don't support these boycotts in any way and, you know, 
can't take that strong of a position, but at the very least, uh, you know, he's coming out against the laws themselves. Of course, nothing's getting done in government right now because of the shutdown things going on. And of course, that's, you know, attracting all the media attention as well. So uh, there, there's not much coverage of these other events. I was kind of surprised to see Tulsi Gabbard announce her uh, presidential run during the middle of the with, uh, you know, this shutdown excuse me, just because it seems like there there's not going to be much time to pay attention to her campaign. Also, she did on the Van Jones show. How disappointing is that? There's an article I'll link to in the show notes page by Kelly Vallejos uh, from the American Conservative where she talks about the revolving door between the Pentagon and the military industrial complex. And in there, she cites some uh, POGO project on government oversight uh, studies done on just how many Pentagon officials are then going and working for different uh, private sector, military, industrial complex companies. I believe there are 625 cases of that in 2018 alone. So just absurd numbers. And I want to talk about this. In, uh, the Yellow Vest protests continue to go on for their ninth weekend. 80,000 people show up this weekend. Of course, the French had 80,000 cops on duty. So <laughs> half the people out there are cops. Uh, they make over 200 arrests, and they used water cannons and tear gas against the protesters. It seems Marcon is trying to chill protests by giving in to, like, the very most lenient of their, de- uh, you know, easiest of their demands, and they're rejecting it so far, and the, the protests go on. They've destroyed 60% of the country's speed cameras. I- I'm guessing that these are things that will give you a ticket if you're going too fast, so uh, I can't help but applaud that a little bit. All right, the last thing I want to talk about in today's show is uh, Israel carried out airstrikes against the Syrian uh, Damascus airport there. You know, it seems that as Syria starts to kind of, and Assad, as the president of Syria, starts to regain international legitimacy and then sovereignty over in his nation, the Israeli is- airstrikes are going to increasingly uh, become kind of controversial and problematic for Israel. At some point, they're, they're either going to have to stop the strikes or find some way to justify, uh, you know, attacks on a sovereign nation that isn't at war with them. And on a target like uh, the Damascus airport, which in some respects is a civilian target. Syria is filing a complaint at the UN about it. I'm guessing not, not, nothing will come of it because the U.S. is on the UN Security Council resolution. But I think, you know, these are kind of the steps that the Assad government could once again take as, you know, they gain that a legitimacy from, uh, you know, in recognition from other nations, you know, looking to bring them back in the Arab League. Iraq is now saying that they're supporting that. And so I, I think this is signs that we're coming to the end of the Syrian civil war. All right. Foreign policy focused at LIBSYN.com, LibertarianInstitute.org, Twitter at K-Y-A-A-A-L-E. You can now find my daily news roundup uh, out on the LP Mises Caucus website, libertarianinstitute.org for all my work, patreon.com slash foreign policy focus, minds.com slash immersion news, and of course that's the name of my news website, immersionnews.com. Thanks everyone.